let's try to connect the dots now between the new IT stack, this culture shift and uh, set of goal, cultural goals that you were just describing, and the role of the CIO and what where CIOs fit into this world. We need to think about how do um, we take this set of technologies, again, whether it's Slack or Facebook Workplace or Box, and how do you marry that with the cultural change that, that organization is, is trying to drive? And, and you know, often it will, it will come from a few discrete or distinct business initiatives. So um, sometimes that, that might be that, that a company is trying, let's say it's a retail operation and that company is trying to communicate with all of their, their, uh, their, their retail environments. And they want to be able to make sure everybody's aligned with maybe it's new promotions or new policies or uh, you know, new cultural efforts. Something like Facebook Workplace then all of a sudden becomes the, you know, maybe the tool to go use to, to make sure that, that that company can, can, uh, can, disseminate, can disseminate that information. We often get brought in uh, a lot of times when a company is facing the need to do much more um, uh, internal and external collaboration. So maybe your partner ecosystem is changing. Maybe you have new uh, partner relationships that you're trying to drive. And what you want to do is make sure that there's way less um, latency between sharing internally and externally. And so Box will get brought in to be able to help with that. But I think the CIO has to be highly tuned into what, uh, how is the culture needing to change? What are the business initiatives that relate to that cultural change? I think that um, uh, the, 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 you know, often what gets missed because, uh, you know, people, when you go and look at like Silicon Valley, for instance, and you, you say, oh, you know, we want to be like Google. It's important to think about which, which parts of Google are you trying to be like? Well, it's not the ping pong tables that make Google Google. It's not the volleyball. It's not the high end chefs that, that make Google Google. I mean, those are, those are amenities because they have this amazing business model. Um, but, but the things that, that at least once made Google Google were 20% time, letting people go out and, and spend extra time building innovations that would not have normally come from the, the standard product roadmap. A high degree of, of autonomy where if you had a great idea, you could go and, and, and present it to somebody. Um, a, a massive degree of information sharing. So Google is notorious about being quite public internally with how the business is doing, how they can do better. They have weekly um, Q&A sessions with the founders. So those are the things that made Google Google. The volleyball is, is sort of a, 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 a superficial facade on top of all of that. And I think we, we sometimes miss that. And the only reason that that you would want to wear sneakers or jeans to work or have open environments is, is merely because when you create a more casual environment, uh, it lets people's guard down so they can be more creative and they can share ideas with one another better. It's not that the genes are the thing producing the innovation. So we have to think about the system uh, that, that all of these components tie into. And so, you know, you'll see, you'll see the CEO who thinks that they're getting really cool because they're, they're now being more informal, but, it's not that interesting because the it, it, the system itself is not using that informality to drive more creativity. Then then it, you didn't really accomplish anything from from learning that lesson. So I think what we have to do is is really think about what 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 is about our business are we trying to change? Why are we trying to change it? And then look to what are the underlying root sort of system level uh, uh, things that drive that change that we're trying to accomplish. Maybe it's getting closer to our customer. Maybe it's being able to hire a new type of talent in the organization. Maybe it's, um, we, we think that we are getting really slow at breakthrough innovations. So we want people to be more creative. Um, and maybe some organizations don't have to change at all in, in this dimension because that's just not a challenge and, and they just want to get better logistics. So I think it's really important to understand what, what it, where's innovation and where's this culture of innovation um, uh, relate to your business model and how do you design a work environment? How do you design a way of working that will facilitate whatever that business outcome is that you're trying to drive? Interestingly enough, you just gave about the most succinct and clearest uh, definition or exposition of digital transformation that I've heard in a long time, but you never use the term digital transformation. Is there a reason for that? No, I uh, just I, I felt like it was a long enough uh, explanation without that. So <laughs> I didn't want to add more words. It's funny that, that you bring digital transformation into this because I, I think everything that, that I, I did just discuss is obviously what 
what I think people are, are trying to do when they talk about digital transformation. I think the challenge is digital transformation often sort of leads people to going straight to, okay, I need this modern mobile app. I need sort of Uber or Airbnb for my business. And, and that is often the necessary result of digital transformation. But the way of getting there is not that you just build an, an app or you, or you create an Airbnb for your business. It's actually thinking through what, what is it about digital companies that allows digital innovation to occur so effectively. And, and it, it, it tends to be the case that a digital company, uh, and in this case, I'm just going to just maybe think of the Airbnbs of the world or the Spotify's of the world. A digital company is run usually, this is, this is obviously stereotyping to some degree, it's, it's usually run in a flatter way with more knowledge sharing, with faster moving sort of smaller units that, that are able to work in, on, in their own sort of specific domain. And, um, and that is usually the thing that enables a digital company to be successful because oftentimes it, it comes from, uh, in many senses, the, the, the way that we build software, which is small teams building projects. And that kind of ripples through the culture um, where, where you have, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost hard to sort of separate the, the GitHub mentality of software development, which is like everything is out, out there, right there. I can see every single change that ever happened from the kind of culture that an org- that a software organization would expect, which is I want to see everything. I want to have access to all of the information so I can make the best decision or I can go look through the history of how we got to that decision. So, so these cultures are kind of inseparable. The software culture, the, the digital development culture from the, how the rest of the company has to operate, the speed at which we have to operate. And that is, I think, why you can't accomplish digital transformation without tying into how's the workplace going to function? What, how's the business model going to change? How are underlying business processes going to relate to that transformation? So that's why we, we, uh, we, we spent a lot of time thinking through those components. How should CIOs think about investment uh, in new technology versus existing technology? It's really interesting because I, I would say three years ago, you didn't really have to think through um, the data question as much uh, around around uh, your your architecture, and and I think that's what's sort of fundamental to AI is uh, now you really have to understand what is the what data uh, uh, are you are you thinking do you think is going to be really important to driving your business uh, uh, in, in the future. Because that data will probably be improved by machine learning or, uh, depending on the, the, the type of data, some form of artificial intelligence. And if you have an architecture design that doesn't let you apply machine learning to that data, or you're not using vendors that are very, very focused on making sure that you can do uh, apply machine learning or AI to that data, then, then you, what you're doing is you're making decisions today that will be severe technology debt in five years, five years from now or 10 years from now. And so really understanding the architecture of how can you work with that information? How do you work with that underlying data and making sure it's set up in such a way that eventually AI will be able to be applied to it. And that'll be different for different companies. If you're a industrial company, then you're probably wanting to think about how is IOT data going to be able to be, be used against machine learning so I can improve my customer's um, you know, maybe health checking of their of their uh, infrastructure, um, and so so that is going to have a particular set of decisions that you're going to want to make about your architecture. Um, if you're in the retail business, then you want to be really thoughtful about okay, where is all this commerce data going? Where where is data about my customers going? And you might want to make sure that it's not going into a place that is going to become a black hole for you to be able to work against. So so I think being able to think through where in my business. Is machine learning or AI going to have some of the most impact? And make sure that you have an IT architecture that doesn't preclude you from being able to apply AI or machine learning to whatever form of data or whatever business process is going to be most um, relevant to to this this kind of automation. So that's the first thing: is making sure that that you're you're designing a future proof architecture. And I think the uh, I'll just make. I mean, I don't. I don't hear this a lot, but I'll, maybe we'll maybe we'll kind of put it into the, the zeitgeist more. But like, I don't hear the word future proof enough, and um, and and I think that a lot of the ways that that we design 
uh, for instance, RFPs, uh, the way that we do IT decisions is very, very um, rear view mirror oriented. It is what did this techno, what is this technology delivered thus far? And that is sort of what the RFP usually delivers. And I think instead we need a, an RFP design that, uh, and a mindset that is much more about uh, what will this technology deliver in the future and not in the next six months or 12 months, not, not like the near term roadmap that you can see. Fundamentally, what will this technology be able to do in five years or 10 years? And for that, it's, you're not looking at the code that, or the features that have currently been developed. You're looking for the principles of the company that you're working with. You're looking at their, where they sit in the value chain of the ecosystem. Are they going to be a vendor that is a neutral platform or are they going to build out all of the technology themselves? How do they value openness versus closed systems? You want to understand the philosophy of the organizations that you're working with just as much as you want to understand the current technology that they've written. So I don't, I don't hear this enough from, from IT organizations. And I think it's, a, it's, I think it's a big miss because I see a lot of IT organizations that will make short term decisions that almost immediately become debt that they're now baking into their IT architecture because they've gone with a vendor that maybe today could meet today's RFP, but, but, where the trajectory of, of that innovation is going to naturally asymptote because fundamentally the either the values of that organization or the architecture that that technology is built on has a has an obvious asymptote. So what one example I, I'll just give you um, to to kind of make this uh, as as real as possible. We um, three four five years ago would see a lot of customers say, you know, I really uh, I really want to be able to share and collaborate on files, but I have to. I have to sort of leverage my existing storage technology because I've already made an investment there. And so I'm only going to implement software that works with my existing storage technology. And what we would tell customers is, if you do that, you, you have to recognize that you're going, you're basically the software that you're implementing is sort of frozen at, at today's innovation. And, and this is a, a period of time right now in particular where there's constant change in the cloud. There's security change, there's compliance change, there's privacy change, there's machine learning change. So you, you might be thinking you're getting a good value because you're going to leverage your, your existing storage technology. But in fact, you're, you're basically freezing the amount of innovation you're going to get at the moment you make this decision versus going with a platform where every week there's new innovation. Obviously, I'm referring right. to us, but, but this, this can be true of any kind of category of technology. So being able to really think through what... Where are the curves actually going, and where where do we see the innovation curve actually uh, actually heading? 